Wow, I had quite the time playing at this table, Yurlock. I have to say, I think you're just the worst. That's because we're all trying to kill each other, Player 4. The best times that we'll ever have are the ones when we're trying to kill each other. I love trying to kill you, and I hope you feel the same way. I hate you. You hate me. We're an evil family with a big group hug. I'll do a damage or two. You'll rage quit in just a few. Welcome to the Uncommon Commander channel, everybody. My name is Ryan, and today's deck tech is all about loving your enemies so much that they can't help but choke on your love for them. Your lock of Scorch Thrash isn't a purple dinosaur. Instead, he's a sorta pink Viashino, one of the lizard people of the MTG universe, and he loves to hug his frenemies. He costs 1 and Jund colors of mana to cast, has a 4-4 body, and has the keyword of Vigilance and two other abilities that combo together nicely. The first of those two reads, a player losing unspent mana causes that player to lose that much life, which is effectively the long dead mechanic of mana burn. It's also the reason that I wanted to build this deck. And the second of those two abilities that combo together so nicely is that he is a mana dork himself. Paying one mana and tapping him gives each player Jund mana. Unless our opponents can use that mana instantly, it's gonna burn them. We, of course, will be using it much more efficiently than they can. Immediately, I'm going to mention that Yurlock has a well-known infinite combo with Umbral Mantle and Sword of the Perrins. Those are usually used to combo with Leyline of Abundance. I don't typically like easy-to-assemble infinite combos usually, but I did include a version or two of this infinite combo in this deck. To be clear, I did not include Leyline of Abundance, though. Instead, the cards I included to make this combo are the aforementioned Sword of the Perrins and Umbral Mantle, along with Mana Reflection and Nyx Bloom Ancient. I chose these two ramp cards instead of the Ley Line because they work better with the rest of the deck, and because to use them infinitely, we're going to need another mana outlet to sink our excess mana into, or it'll end up burning us along with everyone else, making this version a bit harder to assemble than the easy-to-assemble Ley Line version is. So that's one way we can kill with your luck, but there are some others as well, and we'll see those in this deck tech. First up, we have cards that are meant to ramp us. And sometimes our opponents, because we want their cups to overflow with, with mana. Collective Voyage, Veteran Explorer, and Root Weaver Druid will all help both us and our opponents ramp. Just about all of the rest of these bad boys are mana doublers for the entire table. By name, they are Heartbeat of Spring, Keeper of Progenitus, Dictate of Karametra, and Jurta Ancient. I almost didn't include mana doublers in this deck as our opponents have the option of, you know, just not tapping their lands to produce mana that they don't need, but there are a few cards in here that are going to help punish them for making that decision, so we're keeping them. Megas the Candelabra is also going to help us ramp like crazy if we have a mana doubler on the table, but it can also be used to untap our opponent's land, which could be useful later. In a similar vein to these ramp spells, we have more ramp spells. But these ones actually force feed our opponent's mana, whether they want it or not. Eladomri's Vineyard, Magus of the Vineyard, and Shizuko, Color of Autumn, all give mana as triggered abilities each turn. Spectral Searchlight and Victory Chimes give it in the form of mana rocks that let you choose a player. Good for them if they can use it. Bad for them if they can't. Okay, the ramping is over. Except it kinda isn't. Your lock is a mana dork that is almost always available to us, so let's abuse that. Aside from Sword of the Parents and Umbral Mantle, we have these five cards that help untap your lock so we can tap them again. Instill Energy and Nature's Chosen are auras that only allow you to activate the untap ability on your own turn, and only once each turn. Seeker of Skybreak is an elf that lets you do it at any time via tap ability. And Magerite Stone and Thousand Year Elixir both allow you to untap your lock at any time through their tap abilities. Thousand Year Elixir also acts like a haste enabler for your lock's mana dork ability. Now our opponents will be happy to have us ramp for them. They'll be less happy when they start taking tons of life loss from it, and they'll probably try to weasel out of taking the damage by not tapping their lands. So we have some cards that will try to force our opponents into situations where they have to take the man burn. Tectonic Instability and War is Toll both require a player to tap all of their lands whenever they tap one of them. They can choose to tap them for mana, or just tap them and get nothing for it. Stone Shaker Shaman will punish them for not tapping lands via land destruction. If your table really hates land destruction to an irrational degree, 
consider putting Dosan the Falling Leaf or City of Solitude in place of Stone Shaker Shaman. Some other cards that punish people for not tapping their lands on their turn are Power Surge, Citadel of Pain, and Monsoon. Well, Monsoon is actually here specifically to punish the color that doesn't like to tap on its own turn, Blue. It may not be the best card in the deck, but it is so fun to play this while staring right into the eyes of the blue player. The gauntlet has been thrown, Talrand. What are you going to do about it? We also have Wound Reflection here to double up all of the life loss that this deck is going to deal. We've got a lot of ways to take on just as much mana as possible and actually use it, while everyone else is feeling the burn. Some spells that are in here almost purely for their mana sync abilities are the ones on your screen. Gemstone Array will let us pool our mana that we can't use at a 2 for 1 ratio. Rakdos Guild Mage, Ant Queen, and Centaur Glade will let us create tokens to use as chump blockers or to swing at people for extra damage. Gigantomancer will make those tokens 7-7s seven until the end of the turn, which is... pretty good. I also want to mention a card that I fell in love with while building this deck, but I had to cut. Planeswalker's Favor. My only concern with Planeswalker's Favor is that we're going to be giving people a metric ton of mana to work with, so having them have any cards in hand seems unlikely. So this didn't make it into the deck, but I'm totally going to try it anyway sometime. One of the most important parts of any deck is seeing more of your library, typically in the form of card draw. Most of our card advantage is not actually card draw in this deck. That said, the card draw that we do have are Argwell's Bloodfast, which becomes Temple of Aklazots, Zancha Sleeper Agent, Return of the Wild Speaker, and Villas Broker of Blood. Zancha is a nice man outlet for the entire table, so whoever you give her to, they're not going to last long. We have a lot of impulse draw through Commune with Lava, Theater of Horrors, Valakut Exploration, and Outpost Siege. Going out to left field a bit, Genesis Wave will put permanence into play for us, and Diabolic Revelation can act as card advantage, but is also our lone tutor card, and if we use it, we're probably putting everyone else on a one-turn clock thanks to our infinite combo cards, or if we're producing enough mana, a zero-turn clock. Well, we've seen most of our game plan now, but it's good to have some interaction so that we can deal with other players' threats at the table as well. For creature removal, we have Battle at the Bridge, Electro Dominance, and Gang Up, which you can actually play politically with its assist mechanic to basically make it a one-mana removal spell for you. To deal with artifacts, we have Cinder Vines, Return to Nature, and Putrefy. The first two of those can actually deal with enchantments as well. Return to Nature also acts as Graveyard Hate. Speaking of that, Nizumi Grave Robber acts as both a mana outlet and graveyard hate, and then becomes the mana outlet slash theft card, Night Eyes the Desecrator. Finally, we have Drana, Calastria Bloodsheaf, a legendary vampire shaman that can be removal and a beatdown engine all in one with this deck. For board wipes, we have Last One Standing, Lavalanche, and Bane of the Living. Those last two are X spells, so they can work as a nice mana outlet for one turn. We also have some cards that enable Yurlock the ability to do his dark work. Golgari Charm can regenerate each creature you control the turn is cast. Its other modes are extremely useful too. Ring of Zathrid will pump Yurlock up and let you regenerate him. Swiftfoot Boots will give him haste and hexproof, and Mad Rush Cyclops will give him and all of your creatures haste. Finally, we're on to lands. Our utility land package is a bit light in this deck. We've got Kessig Wolf Run and Crawling Barons. Kessig Wolf Run can be tapped for colorless mana, or it can be used for its X green red ability in order to pump a target creature by plus X plus zero and give it trample until the end of the turn. That can actually pump your lock up pretty high, giving you the potential for a commander damage win. Crawling Barons is an easy mana outlet that may become a creature if you choose for it to. Best to hold off until it's huge. Our color fixing is a bit more diverse. We've got the Ramp Lands, Blighted Woodland, and Myriad Landscape. We also have Ash Barons, Terramorphic Expanse, and Evolving Wilds to find basic lands for us and give us extra triggers for Valakut Exploration. More simple versions of color fixing arrive in the form of Command Tower and Savage Lands, the latter of which enters the battlefield tapped. Finally, since our ramp is very green heavy, we have 13 forests, 7 mountains, and 6 swamps. Alright ladies and gentlemen, you've survived the hugs long enough to make it through 95 cards in the deck. I've held out 5 cards specifically so that I could pigeonhole in an extra segment for no reason but for my own entertainment. I unoriginally call this segment THE FINAL COUNTDOWN! I'm going to present to you 5 cards that are the 5 cards I find most interesting in the deck, and you're going to listen to them. I mean, unless you skip forward, that's still an option. 
At number 5, we have a card that makes our army of utility creatures nearly invincible. I mean, as long as you've got the mana for it. And giving you the mana for it is basically what this deck does. It's asceticism. Hexproof as a passive and regenerate for one in a green. That ought to make your stuff pretty hard to kill. Now, there is a strategy that we are weak to, even though I could have introduced more cards to make us not so weak to it. That strategy is life gain. Luckily, I actually did add a card to deal with it, and I placed it here at number 4. Mindcrank is going to turn all of that mana burn into mill against your opponents. A single activation of your lock with Nyx Bloom Ancient on the board will mill each opponent for 9. This also plays extremely well with a flip Nizumi Grave Robber, otherwise known as Night Eyes the Desecrator. So you'll mana burn everyone, and then they'll mill, and you'll get to take the best creatures that they milled. Seems good. At number 3, we've got a card that seems like a clear win for everyone at the table. It's very symmetrical. Its name is Mana Cash, and it, well, caches mana. This card may not seem like much, but it will do work in this deck. You see, to avoid being mana burned, people may not tap their lands. If they don't, Mana Cash will gain a charge for each land untapped at the end of their turn. The next person in line can then claim that mana by removing charges, but if they'll get mana burned by doing so, they won't want to do it. You, however, have something like 20 different cards that act as mana outlets in this deck. You'll be using Mana Cash almost every turn as everyone's unspent mana becomes your abusable mana. Be sure to thank your friends for deciding not to take mana burn damage. At number 2, we have a kind of a pet card of mine. It was in my very first EDH deck as a nice repeatable source of artifact removal. Its name is Vyashino Heretic. And thanks to our untapping shenanigans, this boy can do some real work, removing artifacts and dealing damage. Just be aware that people like their artifacts, so he tends to be a bit of a removal magnet. And finally, at number one is a card that can confuse the board state enough to make people take mana burn just by accident, as it forces them to think a full turn ahead. Its name is Sands of Time, and it's a real jerk of an artifact. Each player skips their untapped step with this card in play. They then untap whatever was tapped at the beginning of their turn, and simultaneously tap whatever was untapped. If they want to use the mana from their untapped lands, they'll need to tap them in response to this and use the mana before their draw step to avoid taking mana burn. This should be less of an issue for you, as you'll nearly always have some kind of a mana sink available to you. This also messes with everyone's creatures, mana rocks, really anything that needs to tap. So yeah, for a fun time making enemies, play Sands of Time! With that, we've come to the final words of our video today. I want to thank you for watching this episode of The Uncommon Commander, and I'd like to welcome you to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss our future content. Now, I'm going to go out and give some hugs of my own, so I'll see you later, my friends.